The next session today is called The Dynamics of Truth. Is truth meant to empower or has it become merely sensationalism in today's scenario? Revealing the truth of this are with us some very eminent names in the world of journalism. I would like to welcome Mr. Rajdeep Sardesai on stage. Our panelists today for the session need very little introduction. Mr. Sardesai comes with over 26 years of journalistic experience during which he has covered some of India's biggest political stories. A recipient of one of the highest civilian awards of the country, the Padma Shri, Mr. Sardesai is currently a consulting editor at the India Today Group. Earlier, he has been the editor-in-chief of IBN 18 Network that includes CNN, IBN, IBN 7, and IBN Lokmat. Can we have a huge round of applause for Mr. Sardesai? Then I would like to welcome Mr. Josie Joseph on stage. <laughs> Mr. Joseph is the author of the just released A Feast of Vultures, The Hidden Business of Democracy in India. He is an award-winning investigative journalist based in New Delhi. His stories have repeatedly fostered public debate and continue to contribute to significant policy and systemic changes in India. His investigative stories include the Adarsh apartment scam, naval war room leak case, several aspects of recent scandals such as the conduct of the Commonwealth Games, the 2G spectrum allocation scam, and other government decisions that have highlighted nepotism and corruption in governance at all levels. In July 2013, the Ramnath Goenka Foundation run by the Indian Express Group, awarded him the Journalist of the Year in Print Media. <laughs> Mr. Joseph was with the Times of India until August 2015. He is presently the National Security Editor of The Hindu. I now invite Ms. Maya Mirchandani on stage. Ms. Chandani is Foreign Affairs Editor and a Senior Anchor at NDTV, one of India's foremost private 24-hour news networks. She has been reporting for television since 1994, making her among the first generation of broadcast news journalists in the country. For Maya, the doors of diplomatic reporting haven't always opened up peacefully. She survived a suicide bomb attack at President Chandrika Kumaratunga's election rally in 1999, reported on 9-11 as the planes hit the World Trade Center in New York, and survived pro-government mobs attacking the media during the anti-Mubarak protests in Cairo, Egypt. From Moscow to Washington, D.C., Cairo to Islamabad, Freetown, Sierra Leone to Rangoon, and several places between, Maya has traveled extensively always in search of a good story to tell. She has received several awards and accolades, including the Ramnath Goenka Award for Excellence in Journalism, twice, and the Exchange for Media Award for Best International News Reporting, to name a few. I request Maya to set the ball rolling and take the discussion forward. Thank you so much for that introduction. I think I speak for all of us when I say that. Uh, and thank you all for being here. It's a Saturday uh, afternoon now in Pune. I'm also welcoming Rajdeep and Josie. I've worked with uh, Rajdeep as my editor many moons ago. Thank you, Rajdeep, for the training you have imparted. And Josie has just written this uh, fantastic book, uh, which is called A Feast of Vultures. I've, it's, you can't put it down once you start reading it. In our discussion today, when we talk about the dynamics of truth, this book, I think, is Josie's quest 
for the truth as he sees it. But I think, um, you know, our topic for this, uh, this session is very interesting because what is truth? I think everybody has their own view of the truth, their own definition of the truth. Uh, my truth need not necessarily be your truth. And I think as journalists, those are questions we grapple with uh, every single day when we do our, our reporting. Um, one of the, the tenets, I would call, of journalism, as I learned it when, way back when, was to be, uh, be careful and be uh, cognizant of the fact that we were going to be representing and speaking for and speaking the truth of all the people that we reported on who did not have a voice of their own. It was their truth that we were communicating to powers, to viewers, to readers like all of you. That truth is not a, not a comfortable truth for many in places of power because it means we talk about poverty, we talk about deprivation, we talk about uh, the, the sort of uh, authority or, or draconian authority sometimes of the state. Uh, those are realities for a lot of people in the country, but that's not a reality people in power want to hear. So their truth is different again. Um, what we are facing today as well is a challenge where um, there is no space to even figure out what really is the truth. Is truth fact or is truth fact as I interpret it? Uh, social media is a great uh, sort of a barometer these days for who decides what the truth is and whether I need to abide by your definition or not because my truth again may be different. I think these are just broad themes I'm sort of, uh, I'm putting out there for all of you and for the panelists we have. But I'm gonna ask both Josie and Rajdeep to actually also make a few remarks on how they see um, what the truth is when it comes to journalism today, what our challenges in reporting the truth are, and how we deal with people who don't necessarily agree with our truth. I'm gonna set the ball rolling with Josie who's dealing with the fact that people don't like his truth. <laughs> well, I, think, I think truth is simple, but uh, I think truth in modern India has a huge cost. And Rajdeep is a very uh, good example of it because he's dared to tell the truth for a long time. I think he is becoming an anathema to the establishments. And I think, at least in the present system, I think uh, many of the uh, things that you see around uh, his own career uh, is a great example of the fact that truth has great cost. You know, I, I wrote this book and already I have two uh, legal notices. And uh, I can, I think, I th and I, I, it, it's, it's, for me, it personally adds to my collection of defamation notices, privilege motions, this, that. So I've been collecting several dozens of them. But when it comes to a publishing house, it, it really shakes them up. And I think the publisher must have spent more money on legal consultation than commissioning me or giving me advance. I wish he had paid that money to me anyway. But the fact is the truth is very expensive. And, and when you uh, dare to speak the truth, uh, uh, let's say uh, about five years ago in the UPA time and other houses came or things like that, uh, I was in Times of India and Times of India was unusually aggressive those days and I was lucky for that aggressive period. And we, while we were doing stories against the government, nobody turned around to tell me that when I said the truth, nobody t t turned around and said that you are a Christian, you are a BJP agent, you are, uh, you are, you are a Sonia Gandhi, oh, no, you, are, you are a communist. But today when you dare to speak the truth, at least an anonymous group of trolls and on social media and here and there, the accusation for uh, you because you speak the truth is that you are a Christian, you are somebody's agent, all that. So I think truth really frightens people. So to that truth, when people who dare to speak the truth, when we do our job, I'm not, I don't think anyone of us presume ourselves as heroes when we dare to tell the truth, uh, it makes people very uncomfortable. And those who get uncomfortable have their own ways. And I think in, at least in the last 20, 25 years that I've been a journalist, truth has never been under so much attack and so much of discomfort as we see it today because uh, uh, corporate interests and uh, very autocratic political forces have all come by in hands to throttle the idea of truth. And I think idea of truth is also very much linked to idea of modern India. So I would presume that both are under serious assault. And, and that's where uh, it becomes uh, all the more important for all of us, especially the younger people, to push back and say that the, at the heart of the society, at the heart of our conversations, dissent has to be protected. I may not agree with you, you may not like the color of my skin or my cloth, but we can agree to disagree. And that is what is disappearing from the newsrooms, from the television channels, from our conversations, 
promote society and it's a very dangerous fact because you are somewhere a minority you will never be a majority always when i'm talking to majority minority i'm talking about your political ideology your religion your language etc so i think we are sitting and discussing this fact at a time when truth and the related values are finding the space that they occupy shrinking and it's a deliberate effort and i think it needs to be fought back right uh, josie just to take up from what you said rajdeep you know we're talking about various factors at play when it comes to even the kind of journalism uh, that we are doing you've uh, had to experience uh, the corporatization of news in your own career as well there is there is a constant challenge a daily challenge for reporters uh, who are out on the field to actually push against a narrative that wants to subsume a uh, reportage in a sense uh, that that a reporter might bring back from the field because that reality is is not what uh, wants to be projected whether it's by the state whether it's by corporate interests uh, so how how have you managed to actually deal with those challenges thank you very much uh, my and thank you for having us here in pune uh, i've dealt with it by my head turning gray uh, before it's time <laughs> i think that we all uh, have you yeah. uh, look no that's a family trait but uh, to take it from where uh, josie left off first of all i think getting legal notices should be treated sometimes as a badge of honor by journalists uh, i knew an old editor who once i did a story for and he said notice aaya ki nahi unfortunately things have got a little bit more difficult i have to go every month or two now to hyderabad because there is a 12 year old criminal defamation case which is there and the police officer concerned refuses to settle out outside court and insist that personal appearance must be ensured and maybe the judge also likes the idea of a personal appearance being made by so called powerful journalists uh and the fact is that we have a terrible law in this country in place for criminal defamation this is a law which was much like sedition brought in during the days of the british rulers uh angrez chale gaye they left behind their laws and they left behind judges who choose to interpret laws Uh, much like the english would uh, much like the colonial rulers would i would ask you all to read the judgment of the latest supreme court judge who is going to become chief justice one day justice deepak mishra on criminal defamation and to my mind it is absolutely shocking that in today's 2016 india uh, criminal defamation uh, should be should be sanctified by law the irony of the case was that subramaniam swami was my co petitioner because he also has a similar defamation case uh, against him and i never thought the day would come when i would ring up dr swami and say i hope you are fighting a good case for me because dr swami and i are on the same side when it comes to this whole issue of criminal defamation it's a it's a terrible law but it's again an attempt being made by in some cases defamation should be there and you should have civil defamation like you have in the west and throw the throw a 100 crore suit at a journalist if you believe that the journalist has lied or has has spoken the uh, has spoken a lie or has told a lie but if if the fact is that you are going to use criminal defamation where you can be put in jail for 3 years uh for uh, uh for telling a story which may be perfectly true but simply because your source has now backed out i think you need to look at the law again um i think that's part of this wider a uh, climate which has been created where there is less and less space for alternative dissenting points of view uh, my own personal experience is when i wrote the book 2014 the election that changed india 2 years ago i suddenly found myself caught between the congress party which thought that i had completely sold out to narendra modi by writing a book which showed that which showed rahul gandhi as a bit of a buffoon uh which he may or may not be uh <laughs> and on the other hand i had i had people saying from mr modi's supporters who said that you know you continue to believe that in the 2002 riots mr modi was you know was either complicit or in some ways incompetent and i said yes because the fact is that a thousand people don't die under a chief minister's watch unless the chief minister is either complicit or incompetent so i found myself in a situation where one side wanted a truth told as they would like it which is that rahul gandhi is probably einstein and this election at the end of the day is just one election and so what if the congress party got 44 seats versus the other side 
who wanted to cover up the darker side and show their leader as always, uh, if not as a Madame Tussauds like wax statue, but someone who is always shining in gold. <laughs> and the fact is, the truth cannot be cannot be defined in relative terms by the individual who would like to see truth as he or she sees it. I think truth cannot often be black or white. Truth often lies in shades of grey. And one of the challenges for journalists is to explore those shades of grey. You see, black and white are easy colours to identify. Grey is a very difficult colour to capture. And it is the difficulty that you have in capturing the colours of grey that according to me is the biggest challenge for journalists today. Because politicians or people in power today expect the media to become from a watchdog to a lapdog. We are supposed to follow the leader. That's the sport that we are supposed to play now in this country. And that, you know, as I call it, we have reduced journalism from being journalism that actually interrogated, questioned, to journalism that is based on what I call selfie journalism. Journalists today are more sometimes interested in taking selfies with people in power than actually questioning those people in power. And people in power are very comfortable with the idea that sometimes they can even reduce an interview to a public address where the journalist will only ask those questions which that interviewer, interviewee wants asked. How are you then going to explore these shades of grey? How are you going to explore the darker sides? I am not in PR. You know, I am, I am supposed to be in the business of telling things which others, which someone wants to prevent from, from showcasing the sunlight on. My job is to, I am the cockroach in the system. You know, they, it's famously said, Maya, that if there's a nuclear blast, the only insect that will survive is the co cockroach. I want to be that insect. I am there in a room full of all these glistening people, the power celebrities from the world of uh, business, from the world of politics, all of whom are clinking glasses and are you know dressed beautifully. I am the cockroach in the system who is wanting to see what is, what is the real face behind the public face of these individuals. And that process, I think, is the challenge for the media and the challenge for the journalist, which somewhere is being lost because either uh, people in power now know how to use power to throttle information, either by filing criminal defamation cases or by sacking individuals from houses or, or finding other ways in which you can hold some kind of, a, of control over those whose job is to actually provide the information you don't want to listen to or you don't want to hear. I think that is the problem somewhere. And that is where I think truth becomes the casualty. Because truth can truth is sunlight. Truth is about focusing sunlight on issues that others would like to keep in areas of darkness. Mm. But now today the people in power like to operate in the dark recesses where the cockroach is not allowed to enter anymore. The cockroach has been told, your place is, and now if I may end here by saying the social media mm. has become a new element that the, those in power now feel that if I put a 140 word tweet, I have communicated. I have bypassed you. I don't need you. I was coming on a flight today and sitting to, uh, next to me was a union minister who told me this very proudly. He said, we have bypassed you. The new regime realizes you people don't matter. I said, TK, sir, no problem. There is abs I have no problem, but the very fact that he was thinking in those terms, I don't need you. I will go directly to the people through a 140 word tweet and reduce you in a way to someone who will not be provided information. I will not provide, I will not take you into sunlight. I will keep you in the darkness right. and I will keep people in the darkness as a result. Right, and I think the, uh, that's interesting that you mentioned that because while, yes, a communication from the uh, state, uh, the center and the state has been reduced to a 140 character tweet, the danger of that, Josie, is also the fact that it has become only one-way communication. There is no forum for uh, the public to question uh, their leaders, the people they elect. Where is that kind of uh, back and forth and that kind of feedback going? to our elected leaders, that's one. And the secondly, on the issue of the, 
you know, the complete vanishing of nuance from debate. It's one thing for, uh, for the discourse as we see it, for the media, the mainstream media, MSM as we have been called on social media, to be pitted against the state and pitted against the politicians. But when we talk about social media, not just social media, frankly, but when we talk about even, you know, perhaps people in this room, even at a sort of a one-to-one -one level in our own homes, in our own families and friend circles, there is this sort of uh, a sort of binary uh, debate that has that has crept in. The lack of nuance is not just state versus media, but also the people in between who are actually saying, choose which side of the line you want to fall on. Yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, Maya, there are, I mean, it's, it's much more nuanced than what you're saying because I think the Indian elite uh, is very easily communalized. And in India, the right-wing concept of right-wing is actually very mixed with the Hindu majoritarians. Mm. So it, it becomes very easy for the politician or the political class who has a right-wing agenda or a motive to play that. So while we were coming from the airport, I was telling uh, Maya that I think that uh, Aravind Kejriwal, uh, in many senses, is very regressive. So, so he again plays to the uh, lowest common denominator. All these politicians, they all play to the lowest common denominator. And they've realized that uh, the average Indian is very easily fooled, especially the elite. When I say elite, the, the urban resident who controls you know, the, 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 the 140 words and the Facebook, the broadband, and most of the state welfare, state money, everything is concentrated, healthcare, education, everything is concentrated in this 30% urban residents. And of that 30%, a smaller minority actually gets a benefit of it. That minority where we all exist, the elite, the, the vultures that I talk about, we feast on the misery of the poor. Mm -hmm. And for us to be misled, it is very easy to uh, provoke that, uh, that, 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 that uncivilized, uh, deep, regressive man in me. So appeal to my religion, appeal to my caste, appeal to my uh, you know, language, whatever. And that is what politicians have been doing it very successful. And there is a cycle, which I see. Every 20 years or so, India, we have this communalization peaking. And we are in that phase. I don't know whether Rajdeep disagrees with that. Uh, from Gujarat, now we were going down. And we are again actually peaking. I don't, I don't know where it's headed. I think we are headed for quite uh, disastrous times. Uh, in, in that uh, process, the binaries are very clear. The yeah. divisions are clear. You are either with me or with the enemy. And who is the enemy? The Kashmiri child on the street who is throwing the stone is an enemy. The, the, the progressive man who is talking about welfare for everyone is enemy. The chap who will criticize Narendra Modi endorsing Reliance Geo license, which is built actually on a forced bank guarantee as my book shows, is an enemy. So the enemy is very simple. The I mean, enemy is defined. And, and all this at some level appeals to the, the, the core concept of Indianness, Bharatiya. I mean, mm. the religious the goodness in us. The goodness right. in us is being suppressed, but the devil in us is being uh, evoked. So the can, can, I, can I just yeah. add to that? Because, since, you know, it will be easy in any forum on truth to only focus on the politician. To my mind, the real people who have got away, particularly in today's India, are corporates. Yes. Hmm. Let's yeah. be very clear. Yeah. Yeah. How much of truth, you know, it's, it's easy to hold politicians accountable. At least the voter can hold the politician accountable every five years. Corporate India today, and the last 48 hours, to my mind, has been a classic proof of that. Yeah. Of the manner in which they now control this country. Yeah. They run India. Yeah. I mean, there are 10 corporates today who if essentially are, to my mind, the people who run this country. Maybe even fewer. How many stories? Two days ago. Look at the, look at the way news works. Three days ago, a panel appointed by Justice A.P. Shah, one of the most distinguished high court judges who didn't become a Supreme Court judge because of a battle between internal judicial battle, puts out a report of 11,000 crores of public money, of your and my taxpayer money, which the Comptroller and Auditor General says is owed to the ONGC by Reliance. Every paper either buried the story or those who reported it, reported it almost in one, one column. Next day, Reliance has its geo launch. Every paper first lead eight columns, all virtually uh, without even checking out on the product launch or without even testing it, are already slurping as if the new world has come to India. Also on television. Rajiv. Wherever, yeah. wherever. <laughs> please understand, the 11,000 crores owed by the same company to ONGC, yeah. single column, buried by most newspapers. The fact is that when the geo launch is there and the prime minister of this country, the next day, 
on the front page of every paper is acting like the brand ambassador of that same company and the fact is that which as one uh, one investigative officer told me yesterday ab kiski himmat hogi ki question bhi kare us corporate ko jab unko malum hai ki pradhan mantri uske brand ambassador hai and that is the nature that that is the kind of challenge that you actually face and why just one company it's true of all across this field over the years the only people we have sting operations on some poor inspector who takes a 50 rupee bribe aur uski naukri chali jati hai and we feel we have done great journalism or some you know hapless official local official in some you know in in, in some department in 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 the government of india what about the people at the top of the chain i have always said three people deserve to be put uh, to be put under a sting one is a top editor one is a top supreme court judge and one should be a top corporate chieftain all three should be caught in a sting operation of corruption and all three should spend then the same time in a prison cell i want all three to be in a prison cell because of the corrupt because i know it's not as if journalists there is no corruption in my field i this but the nexus that has been built between corporate india political india and the and the so called media is such that truth is never going to come out the truth will not is not what is the truth that comes out the truth that comes out is barely scratching the surface of what the actual reality is and if i try as the cockroach in the system to point out the truth today you will be crushed i will be now crushed because the forces against me are very powerful the good news of course is that because of internet and social media you can stop you know there are certain spaces that i can still retain but those spaces are shrinking and they are becoming less and less and we the people aren't worried because we are so carried away by the by the gloss that we see around us that nobody wants to see the darkness that actually lies below the system nobody wants to see it right rajdeep you you know that's a very valid point about corporate and i think we sort of deal with the challenges it poses in the newsroom on a daily basis as well across media houses i'm not just speaking for where i work but across media houses but you know that's one side of the story the other side is when you point out who the enemies are who the enemies of the state when it comes to corruption when it comes to financial bungling when it comes to corporates it's perhaps a little it's perhaps easier to get the public to also think about these things because that also impacts them in a much more direct way you you talked about the child in kashmir with the stone i want to come to that because at the end of the day the journalist who's going and trying to talk about the child with the stone is anti national because they are telling the child story as opposed to the story of the security forces the people who are outside the state of jammu and kashmir or maybe uh, the, the odd people who go there civil society journalists whoever have you are the only ones who have that exposure to that truth as as they may see it but the narrative that has been that has taken over is of religion is of islamic terror is of ISIS coming into India is of Pakistan doing this uh P Pakistan fanning the flames these narratives are very easily bought into as well this is also a truth i mean which is going out to the rest of the country and they're happy to believe it because the people on the other side are fewer and more timid in this current atmosphere yeah i think i think the i think i think the i think the blame uh, should not be uh, put on the people the blame should be put on the, the structure of mainstream media that we have S because uh, as rajdeep said you know the media is more eager to be lap dogs of the establishment than uh, the barking watch dogs you know so what they uh, dish out as the truth uh, is what is being consumed by our semi literate or illiterate po majority population so the other day you know a few months ago some years ago you know i remember one of the channels running a show about how ravan had uh, air force in sri lanka and they have discovered the underground bunkers of ravan and 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 you know you have a situation where a prime minister talks about plastic surgery 5000 years ago and all that so there is there is a consistency that is being fed to the poor or ordinary people so they cannot be blamed for it uh, i think uh, there are uh, there is a problem with our generation because i think we are the first generation which has comfortable life from journalism so we have all become emi slaves you know we take a loan buy a car house and then the struggle is to pay the loan so that brings in such psychological pressure that nobody wants to lose their job and 
in that process i think journalists have lost that primary core capability of what a journalist should have which is to stand up and speak up so when i started realizing that some of my stories especially against corporates do not go through i started storing them after editor do not carry it for months i would store them into a folder in my gmail and it's called morg so my mortuary of dead stories are actually very long and i've actually given access to swadhi maheshwari who is doing a research on state of university journalism uh, and and i've changed eight jobs and i think rajdeep must have changed three four in the last <laughs> so i think i think we are not able to build our capabilities to challenge the regressive majoritarian whatever view that is being put on us and we are very happy to buy what is given to us i think there is a problem with the quality of journalism and the way journalistic life is being built up we are all after buying our houses cars so i think we are in uh, in a, in a struggle for a long time but i think the challenge is going to come from this audience the younger people not the older ones the india is such a young country you can't suppress them with rubbish every day you can't every day evening put up on your mainstream television uh, tv channel some you know match of incoherent people and and you know i mean i see, see suddenly see retired generals whom who were never in the army i mean recognized but, as good generals coming up and giving lectures about national no but you know right. you for example give the stone pelters example more than once now there are various truths particularly that that's where i say one of our challenges is to discover this color called gray there are different truths in kashmir there is the truth of the stone pelter there is the truth of the separatist there is the truth of the of the crpf jawan who has to fight against a force that perhaps is unknown there is the truth of pakistan sponsored terrorism there is the truth of an indian state that has reduced one of its states to a virtual jail for 25 years where after 7 o'clock nothing moves these are all realities question is do i as a journalist pick and choose do i say i will only show the reality of the stone pelter and not show the reality of the separatist who may be behind it and will public opinion be influenced by the choice of my stories so if i choose as you said the story of the stone pelter then do i become anti national and if i take the story of the uh, of the security force do i then wear the badge of india first i mean how am i as a you see my problem at the moment is because we have created possibly unwittingly the real fear in my mind is we are today more polarized as a people than ever before yeah. we are now in what i call them versus us wo stone pelter ka supporter hai wo crpf ke sath juda hua hai he is a nationalist journalist he is an anti national journalist we are distributing certificates of patriotism like confetti in this country hmm. and i find it sometimes amusing that people who are bloody looting this country who have bloody bank accounts in switzerland are who are the ones who are giving me yeah. bloody certificates yeah. of patriotism and nationalism what is your patriotism and your nationalism that you take your uh, 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 your disproportionate your income is completely disproportionate to your sources of uh, uh, your, to your wealth you travel the world you do everything i don't know what your income is you are a bloody cartoonist and you have lived the world uh, you, you you for 30 years you have uh, uh, built a uh, mega industry through politics you are nationalist and i become anti national because i raise variety of truths truth has different varieties right. you cannot say there is only one truth particularly let's say in a complex situation like kashmir or even in a communal riot to give the example if i cover uh, if i cover the gujarat riots i have for the last 14 years been branded in whatever way i have to be branded i am told but tumne godhra ka train burning kyun nahi cover kiya and i am now left to a situation where i have to think in my own mind ki for the sake of some kind of equivalence i must cover the hindu mother's grief as much as i should cover the muslim mother's grief of course i grief for both but the fact is as a journalist i will be in a situation where i will tell the story that i first see and i can i can then i will have to take you back and show you no no but i also went to the hindu mother why should i have to justify that my point is anyone killing any neighbor in the or anyone any indian in the name of religion to my mind is someone who is a shame on this country and anyone who tolerates it is a bigger shame now if i say that if i say that to an audience if you are then going to turn around and say but tum 84 cover nahi kiya tumne 2002 kiye 
I said in 84, I was an 18 year old in Mumbai enjoying life very far away from Delhi uh, Sikh riots. Who am I to then tell you that we've covered 92? Am I supposed, you see, we have as a society po started polarizing ourselves. Yeah. And this is what the people in power want. They want because they thrive on our divisions. They do not want, as I said, they do not want you to step into the darkness because they are creating a manufactured truth about what is true and what is not. 90% of the television journalists who sit in television studios or the generals or the various people who talk about various issues or related to Pakistan or Kashmir have never stepped into either Pakistan or Kashmir. Right. But sitting in a studio, it is easy. Retired, retired bureaucrats discover corruption after they retire. Retired generals discover their muscle after they retire. Retired journalists also sometimes discover their conscience after they retire. Because when you, when you are actually in the field, you pay a price. Hmm. Somebody told me, you know, when I was leaving CNN and IBN, they said, you know, why? You know, the problem is that the new owners feel you are inconvenient. I said, inconvenient means what? Inconvenient means it's like a bureaucrat. And then I went and met Mr. Julio Ribeiro, who told me, you know, through his entire police career, he said, Rajdeep, I carried my, uh, my transfer order in my pocket. I knew that if I stepped up beyond certain lines, I would be transferred. The same thing today happens to journalists. The same thing happens to many, many honest people in this country. Hmm. I'm not asking for a certificate for honesty, but I will challenge your decision to give me a certificate for patriotism. And as I said in an article uh, not too long ago, if you think I'm anti-national, then jolly well I must be doing something very good in my life. Because the people who call me anti-national are people who should sometimes look within and ask what they have done for this country and what they've done for society. They divide us. And we as people, we can applaud here and do whatever. When we go out into the reality, please do not allow these people to divide you more than they already have. That is my plea to you. I think, um, Josie, taking on from what Rajdeep has said, I mean, and this, this anti-national uh, slur is something, I mean, I get called uh, a Pakistani every day on Twitter, go back to Pakistan, go back to your country, only because I went to Kashmir and, did, and filed a few reports last month. So, you know, that just going there uh, makes you anti-national. In the case of the JNU sedition case, we saw this division uh, of uh, who is, uh, you know, Indian and who is anti-national. But let me ask you, there has been criticism of the state, of authority. No, this is not the first time journalists are doing it. It's not the first time people, students, students unions, politicians are doing it. Where has this discourse of my nationality or patriotism coming into question suddenly come from? It seems to me that in all the kind of divisions we report on, in all the kind of divisions we deal with in society, uh, caste, religion, economic class, what have you, this is something which to me strikes, uh, seems to be something new. Uh, there's a fundamental thing which we need to think of as Indians, which is the very basic electoral system that we have, which is first past the post system. So, Arvind Kedriwal gets how many? 67 seats out of 70, yeah. but mind you, BJP got almost 25% votes. Narendra Modi becomes a prime minister with thumping majority, but he gets only 30% of the caste votes. So we have a problem. It's very easy to manipulate public opinion, public perception because of the very electoral process we have. Let's say our parliament had better representation of the public. It would not be so bad. And second thing is, I think the Congress and the BJP and the Samajwadi Party and the BSP and the Muslim League and everyone knows that this division, the bitterness between people, between neighbors is helpful to them. Mm. So we do not have a single party. Congress once used to be which anymore stand up for the idea of India in the very constitutional terms. I'm not talking about liberalism or whatever. If constitution says that we have to be scientifically progressive, how many political parties in this country are committed to it? So feeding on regression and division is actually politically the easiest thing to do. And that's what political parties are doing. Right. And that is why all of us get branded. But my solution to social media is that I was forced to come on social media last year when I joined Hindu by my editor. Uh, I do not respond to anonymous trolls. I, I seriously ignore them. And, and sometimes they come in hordes. In the morning, suddenly, you'll, you'll see them in hundreds. But you can't. I do not decide my sense of truth and honesty and reporting based on the popularity on social media. I give a damn about them. Hmm. I give a damn if my father is unhappy. You know, there was a time in 2009, just before Lok Sabha elections, 
A.K. Antony as the defense minister approved a 10,000 crore missile deal with Israel containing something like 6% business charges. And I found it very odd and I started a series of articles in DNA which Mr. Jagannathan was editor. And we called it UPS Bofos. You know, when I went back home, I mean, Antony did not talk to me for months, but anyway, he's a great man, so we are great friends. Again, we are family almost. When I went back home, uh, many of my cousins and relatives were very upset with me because I dare to speak or criticize A.K. Antony, who is a Christian from my village and who is supposed to be honest, right? <laughs> so we have a fundamental problem. The problem is that truth is only truth if it is convenient to you. I think we need to get out of it and, and that, that comes from your education, from your schooling, mm -hmm. where you are, you are, your daughter, your child is supposed to mug up, come and vomit it out on the question paper. You are not supposed to ask a question back. This morning, you know, two of us were uh, sitting there and uh, two boys came. So I, I said, uh, he came and told me that, sir, you know, you'll go with uh, Maya, ma'am, she's coming. I said, but I don't think Maya will travel with him because she's very famous. <laughs> and he takes it very seriously. He <laughs> can't even stand back and tell me that, you know, I think I thought you are more famous or something, whatever it is. The <laughs> fact is that... <laughs> As it turned out, our traveling companion was better off than both of us, so, you know. <laughs> so, the fact is that we are teaching our children to mug up. Our educational standards, in especially university, is pathetic. <laughs> and we are, we are, at best, factories that produce kids who can barely work. Yeah. No, also, it's because, you know, <laughs> The lines between truth and propaganda are so in, are so spurious in this. Yeah, in fact, Rajdeep, I was just going to ask you on, on that because, you know, a lot of the, the questions that we're asking also are questions we need to be asking ourselves as journalists. And that's what I think we're also trying to do as honestly. Hasn't our journalism also become so access driven now? Because if someone doesn't like you, they will just not talk to you. So how are you going to go and do your job and report on a story? as the case may be, if you're going to be shut, shut out. That's the chance you take. No, th that's, you know, I think life for investigative uh, journalists as well as for anchors particularly has become very difficult. Because the anchor wants access, the, invest in, he want, uh, the anchor wants the, uh, guests, the, in the guests studio. in the studio, the investigative journalist needs access. Now, once you start closing the doors of access and you find that social media is an effective way of one-way communication, in social media, I give my 140 uh, words in a tweet, uh, characters in a tweet. I then don't need to do, get into any question and answer debate. And let's be true. And it's not as if it's recent. Sonia Gandhi has been in public life in this country for almost 20 years. How many, How interviews? many interviews? I did one interview with her where she walked out twice. The only reason you won't see the walkout is she told me afterwards, I told her, Madam, if you don't come and sit down, I will have to show the walkout. She came and sat. We did the full <laughs> interview. That's the truth. The fact is, she hasn't done more than two and a half serious interviews in 18 years in public life. Narendra Modi, to his great credit, I remember him in another avatar when he and I were actually on very good terms, used to regularly speak. Now Narendra Modi has got into the Indian disease of giving that, of monologues. That I will decide now, tum suno, mai bolunga. It's a pravachan now. It's no longer Q&A in the truest sense of the word. No one can give cross, uh, no one can really cross question the Prime Minister. You have, you have the other leaders of this country. Rahul Gandhi gave one interview and decided after that, kabhi nahi karna hai. Right? Just as well for his political now, which, career. Now, which I democratic so. society, which democratic society will allow its leaders to get away without... Uh, Jai Lalita has been in power now. She will, she's got a second term. So she'll be in power a decade, has not given a single serious interview. They, uh, 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 virtually everyone, everyone, you can go from state to state. Mayavati. Possibly the next chief minister again of Uttar Pradesh hasn't spoken. No questions can be. How do I ask Miss Mayavati that, Madam, what are your sources of income that have allowed you to have so many houses in the name of you and your relatives? We did a story based on an RTI. My OB van was burnt in 2000 and 2007 or 8. Nobody came to protect me. No individual, no society, no people who are applauding today said, Nay, nay, yaar, hum log sab raste par aayenge aur isko defend. Nobody came. And, there, I, and since then, after that incident, nobody has even dared to ask uh, my and she was chief minister then. So nobody has since asked her those questions. Should I not be able to ask Mulayam Singh Yadav ji? You have all, you have a house. The other day I was in Dubai. One of my friends took me and people outside know. The NRI took me. They know about it. 
Who's going to, and if I do it, I will have a criminal defamation because I, my sources are not going to come on camera and confirm that this is so-and-so's house, but it is, it is well known. Who, there is an Indian minister who owns an island of the coast of, uh, 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 of the coast of Thailand. I would like to know where he got the money to own that uh, island of the coast of Thailand. Am I to ask the question, not ask, what do I do? And who's, which, which editor or publisher will have the confidence in putting that in the public domain? Yeah. So I think, I think these are, I think as journalists also, we face very difficult times. It's not easy. Yeah. How do I actually, and, and what is the incentive for a young journalist to actually today become an investigative journalist? The incentive is for him to become someone like me in, uh, in a anchor in a show, get six people and get them to shout at each other. What I call the Ravan school of journalism because one day you'll have 100 heads in a TV studio. Now is that journalism? But that has become the new, uh, the, the, the new norm. And what is that? Does en Do any of those stories or any of those debates that you do ever result in the truth being uncovered even once? Yeah. So the, the challenge is that we have also taken the soft options. Because TRP hai usme. So we have decided that there is TRP in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in having 100 people shouting at each other. There is no TRP maybe in going to Kalahandi and finding out as we suddenly find when a visual image comes that a father has to take his son on the shoulders to a hospital because there is no hospital which is willing to take the son. And that is the strait of our, uh, of our hospitals in several parts of this country. Now which, which organization is willing to do a nationwide campaign on a sustained basis till the health minister says that every hospital will have the facilities. Won't happen. I'll come back 10 years from now to Pune and the same thing will happen. We but we will say Achhe Din have come because Achhe Din have come for India, what I call India A. There is India A, there's India B, there's India C. Yeah. And India C has disappeared off the media map of this country. No one cares for India C till some stringer comes with one footage of somebody carrying his son on the shoulder yeah. because no hospital will take the dead body to the cremation ground. What kind of a society have we become? And the media is a reflection of this society. Josie made a good point. We've enriched ourselves. We've become, and I'm no different. I know what I was 25 years ago, but the idealism is crushed time after time because there are people out there, you realize that that's the way it is. Hmm. You know, it, 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 and, and, and the challenge is for you, the viewers, and all of us to realize what we are doing for the next generation. The next generation must know the truth. They must be told these stories. Why should they not know the truth of this country? Why should they not know that Daud Ibrahim, for example, was funding half a dozen politicians in the great state that we sit in? Why, do they, why should they not know that this entire city today is built on the basis of Benami transactions in real estate? You know it, I know it. I know who the people are. We all know it. But do any of us have the guts to put it on uh, in a newspaper or put it on television and expose the person? We don't. That's the truth of the matter. And those people are venerated today. And as Josie said, they get elected. And elections are deemed. That means, sab kuch maaf hai. Once you are elected, as I was told, Are, kab tak aap ye Gujarat chalaoge? Teen baar to jeet gaye. I said, chunao jeetna aur moral compass hona bhoat alag cheez hoti hai. Just because someone from this city will win an election time and again, does that mean that the person has not engaged in corruption? And should my job as a media person not be to expose him or should my job be to be his foot soldier and say Salam Sahib? That's the, that's the question we have to start asking ourselves. I have often said therefore people like me, many of us should now retire and open up a chai ki dukan because when you open up a chai ki dukan, who knows you might become the prime minister one day. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> did, did he really run a chai ki dukan, Tajib? I might live a more honest life and an As honorable a, yeah. life with a chai ki that, that is probably true. The truest thing said so far. That's the truth, really. But Josie, th so two things that, in that Rajdeep is talking about. One is self-censorship. We're all in this space today for reasons that you point out. We've got EMI, we've got loans, we've got this. We don't want to lose our jobs. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is also when you, as in your case, when you said you've got that folder in your uh, mailbox called Morgue, um, the stories that you've talked about in your book so many of the cases that you have talked about have actually gone through an investigative process, have gone through to the CBI. There has been years and you know, officers and money and man hours and time spent on finding evidence. Some of them even managed to get something, but then the cases uh, are uh, withdrawn or they don't see light of day or the judge says there's not enough evidence, whatever. 
and then suddenly their truth is the more dominant truth. <laughs> you, you know, um, <coughs> um, when I started writing this book, I said I need a working title because, you know, as a reporter, I know so much about India. I can write tons of it, you know, like all of us. So I put a working title after several months of thinking, India, a feast of vultures. And I said, uh, like an academic uh, paper, I need to have uh, an academic statement which I'm going to either prove right or wrong for any classical research that you do. So I said, everything in this country is on sale, whether it's a birth certificate or a government. These were my two basic premises. And after, uh, I, I have been working on this book for almost eight, ten years, and at the end of the uh, book, and in the wake of the responses that I'm getting, I can only say that everything actually is on sale in this country. Everything. And when I say everything, it includes media. I don't know if it is a condemned of court to say judiciary. I, I, I don't know who else is going to send me the defamation notice. Everything. So my book actually begins in an ordinary Bihar village, where the villagers tell me that if we had 10 lakh rupees, we would have got this road much earlier. But we didn't have that much money. So we had one person in Delhi from our village who went around the offices and managed to get the road to the village. And the book ends outside Mugesh Ambani's house when the richest man in this country build, decides to build the world's most expensive home, he could not find a piece of land which was not a work of piece of land where an orphanage stood and where 60 poor children used to live. And it tells a lot about us as a society. And every officer who fought that case and tried to prevent that is out or retired. You know, day before uh, from one of the crossroads bookstores in Bombay, one of the IAS officers who handled the case called me in great excitement, saying that, Josie, I'm so happy I saw your book. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm reading the last chapter. The chapter is called House for Mr. Ambani. But then I think that house tells what we really are. You and me, we really are. As long as we are not caught, we are happy dipping our fingers in the honey pot and we are all slurping it up. The poor out there is carrying his wife's dead body, his son to the hospital, and when somebody dies, because they don't even have stretchers. They break the bonds of the dead bodies and then tie them up. Yeah. And we are not bothered. We are not bothered because you are getting your certificates from some symbiosis or some other university floated by some financial fraud. Somebody, I mean, or a Mithai wala, I mean, the most famous private university is Lovely University. And it turned out to be he's a Halwai from Punjab. And, and, and uh, what is it, Amity? Amity is promoted by a man who is accused of financial fraud in Germany. I mean, what country and what society are we creating? I don't know. But we need to, it, it doesn't mean that we can't change. I think the change will only come from the youth. And this is what my prediction, we are headed towards a large youth movement, a youth movement which you can already feel the rumbles of it, and that youth movement will push back and make bigger space for truth to exist. Because today the truth, <laughs> the truth is on sale. Yeah. The media operator, the media owner, who wants to be in Rajya Sabha, whose ultimate dream is to be in Rajya Sabha, and the editor who dreams to be a minister or a media advisor to somebody, they're all on sale. They have a price, you pay the price and they will be sold. So we need to create a new society where we are not on sale. At least our values are not on sale. And that is when truth will actually find its real shape. Truth is very simple. Yeah. So and truth versus fact, or fact and truth as the case may be. Okay, I'm gonna open this up to uh, questions. We have about five minutes left. So we'll take uh, just a couple of questions each from the audience. I'll do it by first show of hands, anybody? Okay, this gentleman right here. Right there. Can we get him a microphone? And if you can keep your questions brief so that we can get quite a few in. Yes. Long ago, you were called the fourth estate. It seems like that's long gone from what I'm hearing from you three eminent speakers here. My question really is that, did you all see a movie called Spotlight? Yes. Surely you did. Now that represents journalism as I think it should be. So why can't we think of Spotlight as the icon for journalists of India today? Rajdeep, that's for you. No, no, there are, there are. Yeah, he's the editor. He gets to answer these questions. No, no, there are a couple of. Look, it's not as you know. Look, we can come. You know, the, one of the worst things Indians do, we come to these gatherings and say, "Sab kuch bura hai." You know, it's not as if everything is bad. There are, there are cases which have emerged in the era of RTIs, in the era of public interest litigation, in the era of bloggers, in the era of uh, uh, of, of activists, uh, competitive politics. 
you know, sooner or later, some of these stories do come out. It's not as if a spotlight-like story has not occurred in this country. There have been cases which involve the very powerful. We've seen it in telecom. We've seen it in, in other, we've seen it with other real estate cases where these cases do come. But to run a sustained campaign of the kind, perhaps, you need a, a society and you need institutions more than anything else, which will come out strongly in your support. I'm not so sure that institutionally we are strong. America is, you know, for all its other weaknesses, is institutionally a very strong country. So if you are the topmost CEO, but you com commit a defraud in America and it's caught, there is a fair chance you will spend your 10, 20 years in jail. Here you will then immediately admit yourself next day to hospital and third day you will get bail and then the case will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. That is the reality and you might even get an award after a few years for your work that you have done for <laughs> society. That also happens. There are numerous examples like this also. That I, so I think institutionally we are weak. So I can, the odd story will come. A spotlight-like story will come in India. But on a sustained basis, you need institutional support from judiciary, from the government, from the bureaucracy, from your fellow journalists, from your owners, from your, you know, the people who own uh, news channels. Yeah. The fact is most news channels, sir, in this country today are either owned by corporates or politicians. What is their interest in journalism? Yeah. Their yeah. interest, they are using it as their w means to access power, yeah, influence. The clock, Raj, That's the truth. No, no, no. It, it's, it's more than uh, today, fourth estate, we are less so fourth estate and more of real estate. Yeah, that's true. And I think when we are in a situation where if we're reporting on corruption or scandal uh, of a particular corporate or individual, and then we have their products advertising on our channels uh, or in our newspapers, that puts us clearly in a very serious I conflict. And maybe one way of sort of dealing with that is to separate management from editorial. And I think that's not a, an experiment we have been very successful in. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, one more thing to what she says. The problem is that uh, we are the only country probably where a newspaper sells cheaper than a glass of Pepsi or Coca-Cola. Yeah, right. Uh, we have a fundamental problem approach towards, you know, uh, my book is supposed to be supposed to be top selling book in many of the bookstores. And what's the number of books sold? Something like 8,000, 9,000. Does the book must have sold how many copies does it in a year? Two, no, no yeah. I was luckier. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in, in luckier, but, but yeah, you know, you will, you will struggle to sell a book. You know, in India, if it's 8,000, 10,000, you're a bestseller. Mine was, I put Modi on the, I was clever enough. I put <laughs> Modi on the cover. I, I did what uh, Mukesh Ambani did. I put Modi on the cover. <laughs> and I managed to sell 100,000 based on okay. the fact yeah. that I so had the right cover. 100,000, how many months? How many? 100,000 now, about 18 months, but in different okay, languages. That's what. 18 months, Josie. Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah. no. What I'm saying is a, a country of 125 crore people where 70, 60%, 65% are literate and where we have millions of people going to English medium schools and English medium colleges, do not buy books. If Chaitan Bhagat were to be sitting here who writes atrociously bad English and I don't read his novel, <laughs> he will have great audience. Great no, audience. No, no, and, okay, and guys, is, I, I don't just, know you guys can't just, hear the just to add, there. just to add, just to add to that, just so that you, uh, you get about an average of 400, 500 channels on, on your, through your cable operator. How much do you pay your cable operator? Yeah. 300 rupees a month? 1000? 300, 400, 500, 600, even if he charges you 20 rupees more, you get upset. Right. So you are getting 500 new uh, channels for 600 rupees. That means the average cost is 1 rupee 20. Out of which the cap the only people who have got enriched in India's news revolution are the cable operators. None of that money comes back to me, which I can reinvest in news gathering. Mm. An average news channel, which wants to spread across India nationally, has to spend even today 40 crores to 50 crores just to pay cable operators and the big MSOs. Yeah. How do you then spend and invest in news gathering? Everybody says, why can't you do a BBC? BBC, the British taxpayer, is paying out of the tax to sustain the BBC. It doesn't happen in this country. S CNN, 75% of the revenues of CNN come through subscription. People subscribe. In India, 95% of my uh, money comes through advertising. And out of that advertising, thank God for Baba Ramdev and Patanjali yeah. and all that. <laughs> every, Hindi every Hindi channel running these absurd programs is being sustained by this man. That's true. Now then, how are you see, you have created an ecosystem that does not allow for the spotlight kind of journey. Spotlight requires investment both in money terms 
and in moral in terms. Moral terms right. And neither we don't have the capacity either in moral terms or in money terms to invest in projects like Spotlight on a sustained basis. That is the tragedy. Okay, that was a very brief question but a very long answer. I apologize for that. And we're, our time is up. We've been granted five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, so we have time for one more question, clearly. Who was this lady here? Go ahead. No, we're being gender uh, equal. Hello, sir. Uh, I am uh, I'm a journalism student and I have one question for Rajdeep, sir. Sir, uh, there, there have been a situation in which you have to select between your ethics of journalism and your job. Is there any situation in which you have come up, like you have to select between your job, you have to save your job, or uh, the e ethics you have to follow? What to do in this situation? As it's brief, huh? Ma'am. <laughs> Ma'am, my one line answer to you. I set up a channel working 24 by 7. I lost the channel in 24 hours simply because I was not willing to toe the line. I have lived with that regret, but I have also lived with the belief, Fir Subha Hogi. That's the way you have to be. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. I, I think one more question. Who put their hand up first? Okay. Where can you see? I, this, this gentleman, okay, all right. Quickly. So over here. How do you look at yourself as the Chief Minister of Goa? <laughs> I will not repeat the mistake I made in a gathering in Goa where I said, you know, why not? And next thing I knew, front pages, Rajdeep Sardes, I ready to be Chief Minister of Goa. So I will never repeat that mistake again. <laughs> I was trying to crack a joke and I get, look, all, all of us believe that, you know, we have something else. To, if I have to go to Goa, I'd rather rest and do all the things that I have to do rather than be the chief minister of the state. I leave it to all these other, my job is, is the watchdog. You know, I have, to, I have to watch over them. But it is tempting. But now, now, don't say this that I've said that I'm going to be chief minister. <laughs> I'm not interested. <laughs> okay, one more, this girl here had a question, yeah. That's the last one. Uh, I think last uh, in last one and a half month there were news that Raghuram Rajan re resigns from or uh, doesn't go for a second tenure. So it was like uh, the most of the article said that he'd uh, spoke out uh, a lot about the government, like he spoke on t tolerance. So I feel that uh, my question is that is it right that uh, if you go against the government, rather excluding this governor post, that if you speak against the government, you won't get the post in some uh, uh, government institution or something like it, and like that. And how just is it? Josie, you want to take that? <laughs> no. Not only that you can't speak against the government, you have to speak in favor of the government. So you <laughs> <laughs> and not only speak in favor of the government, you have to praise them, you know, praise them to the hilt that I think the Nehru Library, Memorial Library chief now believes that Modi is God? Yeah, you know, look, it's there's nothing Megalo wrong if you are in government, like if I'm employed by anyone, I will not criticize the, uh, you know, my employer. Who, my employer. So I can understand a bureaucrat, the lines being drawn. The problem is now we expect everyone to toe the line. Yeah. And I think somewhere, you know, people, maybe this is a final point, and I'll give you this story because it's relevant in the context of India and Pakistan or whatever. Falklands War, 1983, uh, or 1982, I think, 1982 or 83, uh, the BBC covered a press conference of the Argentinian, it was Britain versus Argentina, the war, covered the press conference of the Argentinian uh, military about the sinking of an Argentinian ship, where the Argentinian uh, press office or whatever, whoever was conducting it, severely criticized the British government. Margaret Thatcher summoned the Director General of the BBC, John Burt, and said, what is this? What kind of, you know, the BBC, are you not here to promote the interests of the British government? You're covering the press conference of the Argentinians? He says, Madam, you represent the government of the BBC. I am a journalist. I have to tell the story. And my story will tell both sides, their side and your side. Now, this is perhaps, to my mind, the most complicated thing for many people to understand because we are all supposed to wear the badge of when India and Pakistan and I will then put it on India and Pakistan. Three years ago in 2013, two Indian soldiers were beheaded in terrible fashion on the LOC. Not a pleasant place to be in. 
immediately news channels baaz aao pakistan how long will we tolerate this when will we not go to war how long cruel pakistan all true to indian soldiers day no indian channel of i don't remember reported that two pakistani soldiers were also killed in the crossfire now as journalists i have to report i believe both sides as a citizen you have every right to say take action against pakistan as a bureaucrat as a military general you have to every right to say please bomb pakistan you can you have that liberty the day i decided to be a journalist i did not wear i don't wear the tricolor madam on my sleeve much as i would like to i should not is my belief because if i do then i get into these difficult areas of what is truth what is not truth who's truth i have to tell the story that's journalist job is a storyteller the cockroach as i said the cockroach has to continue to behave like a cockroach the day the cockroach becomes a butterfly and most of us have become butterflies we cease to see the real story we are very happy swanning around from one place to the other that's the truth madam okay i think rajdeep's words we leave it at that thank you all for being such a great audience thank you <laughs> What an amazing experience listening to our top journalists. Thank you so much. Speaker.